I'm talking today from the Center for Robotics and Intelligent Systems. Uh, we're uh, a fairly large center on the west coast of Ireland. Uh, we're a mix between aerial autonomous systems and underwater robotics. So we have a mix of between electrical, mechanical, and aeronautical engineers in the, in the research center. Uh, we're also funded under an initiative by the Irish government, which is called Marine Renewable Energy Ireland. And Marine Renewable Energy Ireland, or MARI, are focused on the development of technologies to improve uh, offshore wind and marine, marine generation devices in, in our oceans. So, <laughs> so if we look at a map for Ireland, and the reason why our, our Irish government are focused on the development of offshore wind and marine renewable energy devices is that we have a significant offshore energy potential for Ireland. If you look at a map here, this is the, the average wave, our average wind projections for Ireland itself. So there is quite a strong potential for the development of energy technologies. However, if you do have strong winds, you also have to, uh, you also have to combat uh, high waves. So that the focus we have in our group is the development of technologies, autonomous systems, to overcome high energy sites. So we're looking at high energy sites such as uh, strong wave regimes and also strong current regimes. So up to four knots of currents and above. So for this, we are focused on the development of resident ROV systems. And resident ROV systems came to the fore in the last two to three years. And the reason for this is really through the developments in the UK uh, industry. And the UK are looking through round two of offshore licenses to push further offshore into more harsh environments. And there is much more infrastructure going off the coast. So to combat that, they are looking to extend weather windows for the industry because they realize that the, the technology that is there at the moment is lacking in what they can provide in terms of weather windows. A commercial ROV can do, on average, about four knots of forward current, but they will take the ROV out of the water when it gets to about 1.8 knots of current. And the same for wave technologies. When it gets to about one and a half meters of swell, two meters of swell, the ROV operator, or the pilots, the supervisors, will look to, to remove that ROV. So if we look at resident ROV systems, they deploy the ROV to the sea bottom, are on an ASV system. And they can continuously have the ROV below the splash zone, so below the, the first 20 meters where the, the high energy uh, potential is. We also see developments in USV technologies. So in the resident ROV system here, there's two varieties, really. There's also AUV systems. But in ROV technologies, you can have a USV, which is deploying the ROV. And this is, is quite a good technology for offshore wind, where you have a mobile system, a system of systems which it can change between substation on one offshore energy wind farm and move around to the different turbines and inspect. Otherwise, you do have the problem of being able to tra transition between the turbines and across the field itself. So we looked at this through the Marais Center and within the University of Limerick. And we looked at developing RAV control systems, which are focused on high energy sites. So optimizing the control for the ROV itself, that it can automatically compensate for, for wave and also current. We looked at the development of autonomous manipulation systems also. So instead of having the operator control the manip system, where there is communication latencies and communication issues, we push the control of the, the MANIP system onto the autonomous uh, system, and we can complete that uh, faster, and also without having to have the communication uh, there 100% uh, of the time. We also then, only recently, and over the last kind of 18 months, we looked at autonomous docking systems, and also finally imaging systems. So this is our Ocean Rings platform. Uh, we first developed this for our Lattice ROV. The Lattice ROV was our first ROV that we built in the University of Limerick. 
It was a 1,000 meter uh, inspection uh, submarine, and we used it for also the the proving this system on an offshore uh, sites off off the coast of Ireland, so off of Cork and also off of off of Limerick, so in harsh regimes. But you can see we have various control systems for you can. You can control any asset of the, the ROV itself from your old pitch, uh, heading, uh, altitude, depth, and also position. We also do some smart controls between the ship itself, so we can have the ROV follow the ship, or we can have the ship follow the ROV. We can also do uh, some smart controls around the heading of the ROV, so we can have the ROV point to a... a feature on the seabed and track that feature, so continuously point to that. Or we can have it also arc around an asset and do a 360 degree inspection. So this is our control system that we developed for Lattice. And this is our autonomous manipulation system. So we developed our autonomous manipulation system. It was developed in LabVIEW, as you can see. But this system was developed for a shilling manipulator. So if you know oil and gas and also offshore wind, the standard across oil and gas is shilling manipulators. It's a Titan T4. So we managed to procure a Titan arm. It was actually off eBay, so we managed to get a good deal on that. It was, a, it was an old generation, a T2. But effectively, the controls and the system is unchanged between the T2 and the T4. You do have higher resolution sensors but it is the same. So we managed to procure a T2, and we've done all of our autonomous developments on the T2 in the lab. So you can see this is our, our six axis plus gripper control. These are direct controls. And then we did some kinematic modeling on this and developed a, a model for the arm. We, we sniffed the protocols for the, for the shilling arm itself and developed an SDK for the shilling range. So we have controllers for Orion's through to T T2s, T4s, and uh, some of the other smaller arms. So we can do Cartesian space control here as well. So instead of moving uh, joint by joint, we can simply uh, move in the x-axis plane or our y-axis plane, z-axis plane. So this is very important for, say, uh, subsea uh, intervention if it's autonomous. But also for it was funded through Mari in the development of underwater cutting tools. So to have a very accurate end effector on, on the, the manipulator itself. So this is just a demonstration uh, in one of the labs we have. So you can see the arm, the end effector here is solid as it goes out in the in the X domain. And you can also pivot around. And, and you can keep the, the end effector pointing towards a specific target. So you can do all types of different smart controls for the, for the end effector itself and for autonomous manipulation. We also then looked at imaging systems and also uh, relative-based navigation. So we developed a dense-based uh, approach, direct approach for, for SLAM. So we're looking at a uh, stereo uh, camera configuration, and we're estimating depth from the stereo, and then we're tracking uh, via an RGB algorithm. So we're looking at a pixel-based uh, track for the SLAM itself, and then we can track our ROV. We, we, we can do up to 60 frames a second, and we get a very accurate track on, on the ROV from the, from the onboard cameras. This is a, a 2D view. We managed to acquire this database. It wasn't one of our own, but we did all of our developments in-house before we actually implemented onto any ROV. So at that stage, we had developed autonomous manipulation systems, uh, SLAM algorithms, uh, 3D reconstructions, and also a RAV control system for an inspection ROV. So we went back to our funders, SFI Ireland, and we, we looked to get funding for acquisition of an ROV system. So we looked at the different ROVs that are on the market. We were in the market for a light work class ROV with a dual manip system. The options that came up was the, the Saab Leopard system, the Ocean Modules V8, uh, there was also the SMD Atom and uh, the RAV Comanche itself. 
So there is various different um, combinations of assets that you can deploy on these systems. But for our control system, we needed a very high resolution inertia navigation system for the, the ocean rings. So we, lo we looked to uh, XBlue technologies for that. Uh, we ended up acquiring a FINS INS and a Nortec DVL. We also have sound velocity probes feeding into the Camel filter further, and we also have a, a submersible GPS on the system as well. So that was our navigation system. And then as part of the tender for the ROV, uh, we looked for the, the supplier of the ROV to allow us into the low-level control of the trussers themselves. So to allow us to, to control the ROV with our Ocean Rings platform, which we had developed for the Lattice system. So that was an essential part of the tender itself. A secondary part of the tender was the ability to be able to control the shilling minips. Now we had done control of the shilling minips for the T2, but when we moved then on to the, the acquisition, we had about uh, two to three weeks to prove that we could control the Orion and also the, the T4. In the end, we went for a dual Orion system, so it's two 7Ps. And we ended up through the tendering system acquiring the Comanche. So the two, the two close calls on the tenders were the Saab, Leopard, and the Comanche. And I think the Comanche were uh, won out due to, due to some of the abilities on the current. And also the system, it was a larger system with integrated LARS, uh, which we couldn't basically afford through the, through the Leopard system. So slightly cheaper. This was a Comanche system then. Uh, we have two modes of operation for this. There's a 2,000 meter tether system, a launch and recovery. And what you're looking at here is a garaging system. So this is the tether management system. So from here, the ROV moves in and out of the garage, and we have 500 meters of excursion from that garaging system. And then from the surface, you have 2,000 meters of tether coming down for the, for the TMS. So our system was a 2,000 meter system, uh, and you deploy then the garaging system to maybe 50 meters off the seabed, and then you excurge from the garage uh, with the ROV. So this is the full system. As you can see, this is the full uh, launch and recovery uh, Comanche. And this is the free swimming system. Now, why we went for this dual combination is the, the capability of to be able to deploy onto smaller vessels. So we looked at the offshore wind uh, cats in the UK, and we, we, we focused on being able to deploy off this. So the, the ROV itself is one and a half tons. And then we have a control cabin and a small uh, winch for that in free swim mode. For our launch, then we, we do a launch for the for the Science Foundation Ireland, and we thought it would be quite good to get the, the Minip control system to launch itself basically. So open a champagne bottle and we couldn't exactly smash the champagne bottle off the RV. But you will see what, what we came up with there. So it was, it was quite entertaining. We got a few news channels and, and whatnot. But this, this is the automatic control system for the MINIP. So it's, 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 it's controlled to, to grip on the, on the cork. And in true Irish style, then we, it, it sort of looks like the ROV is drinking the champagne, but <laughs> it was meant to be launching the, the ROV, but <laughs> we lived up to our, our stereotypes there in, in the launch. <laughs> so that, that was the ROV acquisition, and really we, we came to a point for our research group where we had a, a good solid base for hardware. We weren't continuously fighting with hardware in our labs and having hardware engineers battling with different components and different things. So we had a good solid base for a world-class ROV, and we could also tender then for, for some commercial work, which, which sort of subsidizes some of the research work. So this is the first launch. We launched the ROV. We did that 
uh, a couple of weeks to Champagne a couple of weeks before we got on ship. And the first ship we got, we were meant to have 10 days on the, the Commissioner of Irish Lights vessel, the Grande Whale. So this is a TP vessel. It's one of only two DP vessels in Ireland. And these are also one of our support companies in the Marley Center. So this is the Grand Whale system. It, it costs about 18,000 euro per day, so it is quite a, quite a large vessel. And through the ship time program in Marine Institute, we managed to get it 10 days uh, ship time. However, uh, within the contract, the Commissioner of Irish Lights, they manage all of the lighthouses and all of the infrastructure with regards to shipping around the coast. So within every contract, they do have a clause. If there's an emergency, they can cancel the mission. And it, it sort of happened two days in that they, they did cancel the mission, which, which was sort of awkward. So these are the missions. As I said, we launched the RV back in May 2008. We managed to get two days off of Galway, off the west coast. We ran 24-hour ops, and we did some autonomous manipulation systems, some multi-beam systems. And for the ROV, we have a Rezon multi-beam, it's a 7125, and we also have a Coda Echoscope. So the Coda Echoscope is a, it's a 3D sonar system. It's 128 beams by 128 beams, so it's quite unique. Uh, the Rezon system is 512 beams, so it's a line. Uh, but these are the two multi-beam imaging systems that we have. And then we also have the, the onboard cameras for photogrammetry. The second mission we managed to acquire was a two-day ops as well in the UK. So we're getting quite short operations, so it is quite difficult to get a team together that will mobilize in, in four hours, get out to the site, do, do 18 hours of ops, and then get back to, back to shore. So the first two operations we got for this ROV was, was quite, quite harsh. The UK one, though, was a commercial operation to do a five-year inspection, or a GVI, onto a substation. This was the Orsted uh, wind farm off, the, off the, the west coast of the UK. So for this, this is our first commercial job with the ROV. And for this, we also had to do some tooling. We have a 10 kilowatt onboard uh, hydraulic power unit as well on the RV with a smart uh, hydraulic controller. So we can do various uh, tooling systems as well with the RV. And part of the tender then was to do cleaning of the anode and estimate degradation of the anodes across the substation. And also to do a, a general visual inspection, the whole asset. And then the third, or the, the, the main part as well, was to image, sonar image some of the, the cables coming into the substation estimate free span and, and how much uh, part of the cable was buried, etc. So these were our first two operations. Our next one uh, was through the Marinette project. So this is a transnational access project that we have. It's similar to the EUMR project, but Marinette 2 is focused just on offshore wind and ocean energy converters. So we supplied our ROV to do some sonar-based imaging. Uh, we did this in a lake in Ireland. So the, the contract through the TNA was to do five days, 24 hours off of sonar imaging. And the, the, the end user that came to use it, what they wanted to do was to generate a, a machine learning algorithm or data set. So we did five days of collecting data of sonar they tweaked every single uh, parameter of the sonar to be able to generate uh, uh, a machine learning code for, for optimization of all sonars across uh, subsea. The last mission, so this is one week operations, and the last one that we, we did over the last year since launch in, in May 2018 is uh, 10 days off the south coast of Ireland uh, using the Marine Institute uh, Celtic Explorer. This is also under the JRA of the EU Marine Robotics uh, Project, which you're familiar with. We also had scientific surveys here. So one of the main focuses of this survey was to... Uh, there was a marine biologist with us that there was deep water corals in Ireland, but 
the deepwater Carl's Ophelia was only ever found in 500 meters and plus of depths. So the, the marine biologists wanted to prove that these corals do survive, but due to overfishing and, and different assets, they do get destroyed. So we were inspecting different shipwreck sites to see if we can find some of this Ophelia in shallow water. So we looked at about 120 to 180 meters uh, depth of shipwrecks. And then we also did some of the automatic docking systems as well. So this is the Ocean Rings platform. Again, you will be fairly familiar with this. What we're doing here, actually, this is a live operation. And we're actually doing uh, transect lines across a World War I submarine. So first off, we, we go to about uh, 40 meters off the seabed. We image the shipwreck, and then if we're capable of going closer, we go maybe to about 15 meters. The reason why I say capable is that there's quite a lot of fishing activity around Ireland, and these nets are covered in, in nets, or these wrecks are covered in nets. So this is the, the CODA system. So this is the live sonar coming in. So this is the submarine itself here. This is a, an operation, a World War I submarine. Uh, German submarine U-boat. It was the first submarine sunk by the Americans in World War One, and this is the the main gun. So it, it's quite good to see the sonar data coming in, and and what we're doing here is we actually have the ROV pointing. It's at 15 meters. It's got about a 20 degree tilt uh, down towards the uh, the wreck itself, and we're we're crabbing along. Uh, the, the wreck itself. So we're pointing at the, at the wreck and we're moving along in 90 degrees. So we got a good angle, uh, oblique angle on the, on the side of the shipwreck. We did various then other ops across the top of the shipwreck and, and also the other side. So it's basically just trying to collect all of the data sets. So you can see this is the main gun that we imaged here. This, this is the, the conning terror section, a secondary gun. And all of this infrastructure here is netting. So the netting comes up maybe 30 meters off the shipwreck. So, so it is, it's filled with nets. So, so if we were in manual operation mode, a lot of ROV operators would just support the mission and come up and, and go to a friendlier site. But because we have uh, the autonomous, we, we have very accurate hold position, which you don't get across commercial ROVs. You don't get the accuracy that we have. So if we have a silt out, we can just hit hold, and we know that the ROV isn't drifting into any nets which did happen when we, when we were doing the sampling on the Lophelia, we did get a couple of silt outs because of what we were doing. And there was netting only maybe four to five meters away. So, so it's, it's difficult operations, but the, the Ocean Rings platform does help with it. So these are just some images of, of the shipwreck itself. Uh, this shipwreck was never visited before, so it was identified during the national mapping system, but we were the first ones to actually visit it. Now this is the, the liner that we visited. This is the SS Canadian. Again, it was torpedoed off the Irish coast. This lies in about 180 meters. You can see that the bow was broken here, down towards the bridge section. Uh, this here is actually one of the masts. And again, all this section here is, is netting. So the netting does come up on the sonar imaging. Uh, we, we transect down across the ROV here. We got to the brake field. So it was torpedoed towards the stern. And we actually found some lophelia at this point here. So just underneath some of the girders, uh, some of the superstructure was some of the lophelia that we actually wanted to sample. And the marine biologist then, the focus he wanted to do was get some sampling from different sites around Ireland. So we had some lophelia samples, uh, DNA samples from deeper water off the north coast. And he wanted to, to analyze the data sets between them. This is the Canadian shipwreck itself, the bow section, and the brake section. The netting is all just down here. And you do get quite a, quite a lot of artifacts, different windows, portholes, uh, pottery, cups, uh, plates, and so on. So, so it is quite interesting. And coming from a, a diving perspective as well, I, I have some, some uh, capability in recognizing hazards, and, and you do recognize what you're, what you're looking at. Whereas 
So it's just some of the pottery on the shipwreck. And a lot of these shipwrecks also uh, carried arms. You can see some of the nets just strung across. And, and these are just some of the, the casings. Uh, I think they're six inch casings. They're steel. And then on the, on the U-boat then there was uh, brass casings and so on. Uh, we also visited a wellhead. So we got permission uh, and collaboration with the Kinsale Gas Works. So there's a, there's a gas field off the south coast and about 90 meters of water. And this is the wellhead in the center. You see the ROV is just doing 360 degree survey of the wellhead. We have a laser system on board. It's a 2G Robotics, a ULS 500. We have the CODA system running as well. And then we also have the, the cameras for photogrammetry. So we have various kind of imaging systems on board. But you can see that the control of the ROV, you know, it's quite unique that, that you can do this accuracy in, in, in waves and currents. So that's quite good. The wellheads themselves, and this is one of the wellheads that we surveyed. You know, that, that's a picture. And then the sonar images come up quite well as well. With regards to the, to the live photogrammetry, or the 3D reconstructions and SLAM systems, so this is a demonstration then of the, the SLAM system. This is the current depth map up in the top right. This is the actual image that's coming off the ROV from one of the stereo cameras. And this is the live point cloud generation. Uh, we call this stereo fusion. So what we're doing is, is recognizing where the ROV and then uh, joining the, the pixels together to get a voxel over time. We did a lot of these ops in the, the lake when we were doing the TNA for the Marna 2 project. So it's using the, the photogrammetry system. We also done the sonar as well, and we do some comparisons between the sonar and geo referencing between the, the photogrammetry and the sonar. This is a comparison then to your typical photogrammetry system. This is a stereo fusion that we developed in real time. And then this is the, the offline uh, generation through Agisoft Photoscan. So you do see that the, the quality or the comparison between the two systems is quite good. This is our system here, and this is the, the Agisoft. We also demonstrated the uh, autonomous manipulation system. This is the Cartesian space control. So this is manual control. To, to move this uh, rope out of the way so we can get it access to the uh, to the valve. And you can see we're, we're using fiducial markers then for the pose estimation for the autonomous manip. So we have an onboard camera, but we're doing the pose estimation via the fiducial markers. So I guess when we acquired the ROV, uh, a lot of the technology that we developed in-house for for the lattice system, and also for the autonomous manip on the, on the T2. Uh, during the first two or three missions, we had to prove this on, on the, the new uh, sub-Atlantic Comanche. So that's effectively what we did over the first two to three missions. With regards to autonomous docking then, and this is one of the main uh, targets for the, for the operation that we did in January 20, 2019. So this is the Celtic Explorer vessel. This is owned and ran by the, the Marine Institute in Ireland. So this is our ROV um, here and your TMS deployments. This is our control cabin here. So this is the setup. And what we did is a configuration of LEDs on the back of the TMS here. So these are navigation lights here. So we have four navigation lights. And we're, we're estimating our pose estimation from the trajectories or imaging of the, the, the lights itself. So as we move the ROV to position, we use the Ocean Rings control platform to move within four to five or seven meters of the TMS garage. So once we're, we're roughly in the vicinity, then we, we get the system to swap over to the, to the autonomous docking. And then we're continuously estimating the pose from the, from the configuration of these navigation lights. 
So these are the navigation lights. So there is a, a number of stages which we do to to narrow down the focus or the, the focal point of the the uh, LEDs themselves. These are standard Teledyne LEDs that you get on all small inspection RVs. So we do an image distortion, we do some filtering, we blur the image, and then we do some digitization on the image itself. So you can see these are the different stages. And once you do some blurring and digitization, you do get rid of artifacts like this here. So this is the tether actually going across one of the, the LEDs. So this can hinder your estimation for pose. If you don't have all four lights in, in estimation, then you can't get your pose. So the blurring and digitization and filtering of this allows us to, to get very accurate uh, calculation of the center point of those LEDs. Uh, for auto, automatic docking then, as, you, as the, right, this is fairly obvious, as, as the, the LEDs, as the TMS wings, the LEDs configurations change and it's from these configurations, these distances, that we can estimate our XYZ position uh, to that center point of that TMS dock. There are quite a lot of forces on the, the garage system. So if we have a resident ROV, uh, ROV deployed from ASV, this is your garage system. This is swinging, so it's a dynamic system. Uh, and you do have your, your different heave for the, for the wave motion. You have yaw motion from the ship itself. And then you have the various other swinging, pulling forces uh, of the system itself. And also, when you do come into the dock, you create force from the thrusters of the ROV to the, to the garage itself. The garage itself weighs about one and a half tons, and the ROV itself weighs one and a half tons. So you do get some, some, uh, some swinging and movements from, from the ROV. When we deployed and, and did our first testing of this system, we developed uh, this system in-house on a simulator. But when we deployed then, some of the first operations is we we docked the TMS garage onto the seabed. So we did a stationary docking of the ROV first. There's 0.3 meters uh, difference between the width of the ROV and the width of the TMS. So, so you get 15 centimeters either side. So it, it's, quite, it's quite challenging to be able to dock into that now. When you're, when you're in a stationary TMS like this, uh, it looks perfect, you know, you do. Get quite a good dock. But then when you move to dynamic and you have all of them additional forces, it is quite difficult to do your dock. And, and there, is, there is a procedure that we use then for docking. Video is a bit slow. So we, we, we ran our tests, we did about, it was one full day of testing for the, for, the, for, the, for the automatic docking. We did about 12 hours the first day, and then on another day we did another 12 hours. The first day actually we did the testing, uh, it was about 1.1 meter swell, so, so you got about 2.2 meters of, of difference in the heave. I was stuck there for a minute. If you watch a, a commercial RV doing this manually, uh, they, they line up the RV and at one point they commit. 
you know so they're they're driving forward with the rv and then pulling in on a tether we do a similar operation where where once we line it up we we commit to the to the operation and we make contact and then you, you try and keep that contact until the rv is is actually docked an rv technician will, will actually do the same operation so that's where we sort of we talked with the operators and and figure out how to how to best approach this as once once you have quite you know a large swell up to two meters as well that's that's four meters of heave so these are some of the the pose errors then on the system so we do get quite uh these are the different this is five meters out uh three meters out too and this is the dock so you can see the error there we're getting less than uh it's about 0.5 to one meter of error uh, between the different uh, angles, yaw angles, and, and poles, X, Y, Z. What we also done as well is for the LED configuration, the pose estimator, and for resident ROV systems, you can see these LEDs uh, from 10 meters plus out. So you can get your pose estimation from above 10 meters. And that's quite good uh, for navigation also. So if you had a, an LED configuration on an asset, Instead of having a, a fiducial marker, an LED will last quite a number of years because you can see it further out, but it can also uh, overcome any biological growths on the LED as well. So, so you do have an asset that you can leave down there for quite a number of years and you can update your positioning system from that geotag. And this is sort of a simple little test that we did. Uh, the, fins, the fin system that we have drifts about, it's about two to three meters over half an hour of ops. So it is quite good. You're getting a DVL there as the main contributor to that camel filter algorithm. So what we did here is we actually turned off the DVL, allowed the system to drift, and these are the standard deviation of the fin system itself. So you can see this is the ROV. It's about uh, 10 minutes of operations in total. But as you can see, once we turn off the DVL at this point here, it, it starts to drift. And at this point here, we actually register our position from the geotag. So we deployed one of these LEDs. We registered our position from a stationary target, a geotag, and then we updated the, the INS system. So you can see once we update it, we're, we're restarting our drift again. So if you're operating in a resident RV field where you have a number of these geotags, you roughly know where the ROV or AUV needs to go to. You get in the rough vicinity and you pick up the geotag from 10 meters out. You can update your INS system. It's another alternative really to deployment of expensive LBL systems. It's a lower cost and it, it lasts longer. It doesn't need any maintenance. So that is me. I hope, I hope it was interesting and, and thanks very much for your, for your attention.